This interview is a part of the Oklahoma Historical Society's oral history program, Living Legends Collection. This interview was originally conducted on February the 23rd, 1965. The interview is conducted by Mr. Frank Doyle. The interviewee is Mr. Orville M. Red Mosier of Oklahoma City. This interview is being re-recorded on April the 11th, 1985, for inclusion in the permanent collections of the Oral History Program by Judith Michener. Yeah, Mr. Red Mosier and our second time around on this, and we're going to devote this to the library on the subject of the aviation. That marvelous, that uh, dramatic and, and exciting way of life. Uh, particularly as it affects Oklahoma City and Oklahoma and its environs. So, we'll see if we can jog your memory back to those early days when uh, you were, uh, who knows what, but at least you were flying somehow, right? Right, Frank. Uh, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to discuss aviation, mm -hmm. first as uh, an industry, Next, uh, as it relates to my native state of Oklahoma, it seems coincidental that the birth of the airplane happened in the same year uh, after literally thousands of years of recorded history showing man's desire to conquer the air, but yet it was uh, within our time uh, in, uh, that the Wright brothers were the first successful pilots of the heavy and air machine. And it was the same year that Oklahoma was admitted to statehood. Mm. It's paradoxical that we who are native to Oklahoma think of ourselves as being such a young state, which we are, but so few of us today look at the modern aircraft and think about the aviation industry being no older than our uh, state of Oklahoma. Mm. But there so happens that both of them were born at the same time. The state of Oklahoma was not the earliest of the states to enjoy the flying machine, of course, because it was first put into the military and then into a couple of flying clubs in the east and then for exhibition purposes. But although the uh, first flight was 1907, we in Oklahoma in June of 1910 had the opportunity of seeing the flying machine here in Oklahoma City. Uh, I think I told you before of my interest in that particular incident and mm -hmm. how it inspired me to uh, be interested in the future of the air. After 1910, we had uh, several exhibitionists uh, appear here at uh, various gatherings, including the State Fair and other uh, exhibitions. We had some great, great pilots of the day. Most of them, of course, are gone but we had Ruth Law in one of her earliest uh, exhibitions here in Oklahoma City. And uh, during that time from 1910 to 1917, which was the start of World War I, uh, all of us who were interested in the aeroplane uh, had some opportunity to be around and see uh, what was being uh, flown. I myself uh, had an opportunity to work with a so-called designer and builder, and uh, he built his airplane, corrected his power plant, and uh, if you will recall, in those days, you used ether instead of petrol, mm -hmm. or gasoline as we know it now, because the power plants were small and they had to be revved up fast and take a lot of power out of them to get an unwieldy aircraft into the air. So. I had the very important assignment of uh, running alongside the airplane, holding on the one wing while my school chum held on the other wing. So you can <laughs> see that was an important contribution right. to the airplane. But to me, it was important, and no doubt it was important to the uh, so-called pilot because he had to have someone do that because he didn't know how to fly it himself. <laughs> now the location of that particular experiment uh, is uh, was a pasture north of uh, 13th Street uh, between Lindsay and what is now Lincoln Boulevard. Mm -hmm. That was his pasture where he built his airplane and where we ran it up and down 
Uh, and with the prevailing south wind, obvious we'd have to push it back up north and then run alongside of it as he powered it coming uh, into the wind to the south. It was not a success. To my knowledge, he never flew the airplane. And I don't know whether it's his lack of courage in his own invention or whether he, the airplane just wouldn't get aloft. I was not that knowledgeable. In the 1914, 15, 16, with the World War I going on in Europe, it was easier for us to read of some of the developments in the military effort at, uh, uh, in World War I in Europe. Needless to say then, by the time that we got into the project, we were pretty uh, interested in the airplane, uh, the, being that we were the birthplace of the machine, but we uh, absolutely had not developed anything. It was pitiful, uh, our lack of interest in developing and building the airplane here in the United States. As we came near to entering the, the war, uh, we did have copies of uh, British and French airplanes, and uh, some contracts were let to build some military airplanes. But it is surprising, I know, to you possibly, to think that even through the end of World War I, although we had many uh, Americans over there flying for the French and for the British and for our own uh, services, there was never an American-made airplane ever went across the lines in World War I. Mm. We were flying foreign-built airplanes all the time. But uh, I went into the service in 1917, and uh, at that time, we in the aviation section of the Signal Corps uh -huh. uh, was a part of the ground services. We had no independent service for ourselves. And they then set up the School of Military Aeronautics at uh, several universities throughout the United States. And they selected their cadets, uh, which I was one, and uh, we were then given a very, very fine course in that in uh, aeronautics, and my particular case was at the University of Texas in Austin. But by uh, the time we graduated, we then were set into uh, assembly regiments because we had no airplanes to learn to fly on, and we had more cadets than we had instructors or uh, had airplanes to fly. So it was awfully slow in getting started hmm. into the service, even though we were actively a participant in World War I. It seems peculiar as we think of all the things that happened in aviation today in Oklahoma to realize that although the opportunity was there for all to enlist, and uh, the draft was not as prevalent in World War I as it is today, the officers' training camps for the other services were loaded on the thing because they, everyone that has a college graduate that wanted a commission went out and worked for him. And yet, in the state of Oklahoma, of all the uh, men that entered the services and graduated and were commissioned as aviators, that means gaining their wings to it, there were only about 70 in the whole state of Oklahoma that were registered, that know second. that they are there. And of those 70, and although being native and being active engaged in aviation through all these years, I don't know, 20 of them, or never heard of uh, more than 20 of them. So obviously, not many of them stayed in aviation after they got their wings and the armistice <clears throat> was signed. Now to Oklahoma City. Uh, during 1917, when Post Field was activated at Fort Sill, as an aerial observation squadron, uh, observing the artillery units that uh -huh. were at Fort Sale. Uh, being an applicant for the School of Military Aeronautics, naturally I, I visited there and knew all of the officers. And Oklahoma City was the nearest social retreat for those men stationed there at Post Field. So it was quite exciting to have these friends fly up to Oklahoma City, and at that time they uh, landed uh, in the early days of the war. They landed on this same pasture where I, as a kid, uh, had worked with this uh, so-called builder and, 
and uh, inventor of his own aeroplane. <laughs> and it was extended, and it ran along Lindsay Boulevard up to now, where the uh, uh, governor's mansion is. Mm -hmm. So these uh, fine-looking young men and their puttees and wings and Sam <laughs> Brown's belt would come flying in, particularly to make the Saturday afternoon dansants, mm -hmm. which were at the Hawkins. Uh, and it would meet them, and uh, you'll never know what a privilege it was for a young redhead to be out there and hear these big 90 horsepower engines powering themselves along <laughs> and uh, land and all the little debutantes and sub -debs of town were out there to meet them. Their mother, matronly mothers uh, would have the, the convenience to take them then under the wing mm -hmm. and drive them to the hotel and chaperone them through uh, a, a very, very serious war. <laughs> but uh, many of those romances bloomed into marriage and some of our very fine families of Oklahoma uh, were a part of uh, the romances of the first airplanes, military airplanes, visiting in Oklahoma City at weekends mm. for the Don Sons and the social activities here. Uh, after that field uh, was developed, we then went out off of Agnew Avenue uh, where the Will Rogers housing program is now. And that was a, a little field where you came in and crossed the Agnew between Western Avenue and Pennsylvania to identify it today. And landing to the south, landed in there in a, a little field, and that then became the, the airport for Oklahoma City. And uh, although we had a couple of accidents there, uh, it was more the fault of the pilot area than it was the fault of the landing area. From there, uh, we then, after the war, we flew there for a while and then uh, went out to the corner of uh, 59th and Shields. Mm -hmm. That's on the old interurban line to Norman. It's now developed and you would never recognize as having any open ground out there. But the reason that that was picked was because if we, this now is after the war, we who were flying airplanes and commercially, mm -hmm. chose that site and had a, a hangar was built there. So if we got caught out in the dark, we could circle around until the interurban came north or went south and we could land by his, by his flood beam uh, light mm -hmm. that was showing its way down the tracks to Norman or up to Oklahoma City. So that was the first lighting system <laughs> in Oklahoma City. After that airport was starting to develop, we moved out to Southwest 29th, where school land was there. It's where the Trap Club now has on a little nine old golf course. Mm -hmm. We took the west side of, uh, of that school land and put in the airport, and that became uh, the prominent. Such businessmen as Burl Tibbs, Chibi Graham, mm -hmm. Clarence Page, Mm -hmm. All had uh, schools or were identified with selling of airplanes or something, and they were all located at that location. And then the uh, National Air Transport, with the sub uh, subsidiary of what is now United Airlines, mm -hmm. uh, had the mail contract from Fort Worth, Dallas to Chicago. And uh, they were the first mail contractors flying the Curtis Pigeons through here. And it was uh, quite an experience to watch the people of Oklahoma City come out there at night and watch the mail plane come up in the south, land and take on a little sack of mail and off a little sack of mail and then take off and power himself over 29th Street and head north of Oklahoma City to his next stop, which was Ponca City, on his way to Wichita, Topeka, Kansas City, and on into Chicago. Those were uh, hectic days, but the first night, organized night flying that we had here. After leaving Southwest 29th, we then uh, uh, had the bond issue, and the city decided to build an airport for themselves. And that's now the forerunner of Will Rogers Airport. From Will Rogers uh, Airport, 
satellites were uh, put in uh, later on at Two Lakes, mm -hmm. which is now Wiley Post Airport, and uh, at Cimarron, which is the city airport again out west, and there's where Clarence Page has his aircraft maintenance program. Uh, that generally covers the major airports in the city of Oklahoma City. <coughs> the uh, important part of that development is that the city was not sponsoring airports. Although I will say this, the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce throughout all of these years has always had a very sincere and enthusiastic response to the value of the airplane. And uh, I'm glad to say that uh, their support has made Oklahoma very, very renowned in the field of aviation today. I heard General McNichol, the commandant of the uh, Air Oklahoma City Air Materiel Command, a tinker, show a graph the other day was showing the history of the tinker field itself and its effect upon the economy. Well, let's take our home city, Oklahoma City. They have 23,000 employees at Tinker Field. Mm -hmm. It's Oklahoma's largest industry. Uh, one out of a dollar, one dollar out of every five in Oklahoma City is generated through the establishment of Tinker Field in Oklahoma City itself. Now, you can see what a tremendous uh, uh, economic benefit the airplane and the established at Tinker has been to Oklahoma City. Now you go right across uh, 74th Street and you come on out there to 59th to 74th, you'll find Will Rogers Airport, which I told you was just a pasture. Mm -hmm. And the council was bitterly condemned for going that far out to have an airport when we'd always been accustomed to closer in airports. Right. Mm -hmm. But they did and stood a lot of abuse. Well, today, when the FAA put in their aeronautical center out there, they have about uh, 3,000 employees, but they keep almost a continuous class of foreigners from all over the world that are sent in here to train uh, on behalf at the invitation of our own government. So it has had a tremendous effect uh, on the economy also because of uh, the the expenditures go there in their training program and plus all the records of every licensed airman in the United States is held here at Oklahoma City. It's all mm -hmm. here and this is the headquarters. Now that was uh, developed through the imagination of a, a native Oklahoman, Colonel Benny Griffin, Bennett Griffin, graduated of Oklahoma University, a pilot in the First World War, <laughs> and uh, he uh, was with the Civil Aeronautics Authority at the time in Houston. They wanted to put a blind landing uh, field in, train their inspectors in the field of blind landings and uh, uh, blind navigations. And uh, so he, being loyal to his hometown, uh, got the race to bring it on here. Mm -hmm. And it was, although it was a small unit. It nevertheless was the foundation of the FAA's uh, tremendous plan and activity on the west side of Will Rogers today. Uh, going at that time, Tom Braniff uh, started the Braniff Airways. What year was that? You recall? He started in 1928. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Tom was not the uh, uh, promoter for the Braniff Airways. His brother, younger brother, Paul started Braniff Airways. Tom was a successful insurance business here. But his brother Paul started Braniff and ran it and is the, really the founder of Braniff Airways. But he had financial problems with getting an airmail contract and uh, was not best repute. So Tom went in to redeem the name mm -hmm. and then went in and developed and built Braniff Airways. It started here <coughs> and uh, it had a very hard a road a hole, but they uh, worked at it, and today it's a very fine airline whose birthplace was Oklahoma City. Central Airlines' birthplace was here, and they only moved to Fort Worth uh, after they were well established as Central Airlines. Mm -hmm. And in Tulsa, 
Earl Halliburton uh, started the first of the trimodern Fords. He ran the route from Wichita Falls to St. Louis, <coughs> and he called it Safeway. And it was the largest fleet of trimodern Fords in existence at the time. And uh, that later was acquired by uh, American Airlines and is uh, part of the route now from Dallas Fort Worth to Chicago via Oklahoma City and Tulsa and uh, Springfield and St. Louis and so forth. But that was started by uh, Oklahoma City and then Earl Halliburton, whose tremendous success is known more for the fact that the Halliburton Company of Duncan, mm -hmm. one of the oil wells, the world's largest oil well cementers, mm -hmm. as you know, but he was an avid aviation enthusiast and one of the earliest owner of an airline. Hmm. Another thing that's not very well known about our native state and field of air transportation is that uh, the first transcontinental air transport, and that was its name, TAT. TAT, yes. Sir. And uh, that started with a combination of the Pennsylvania Railroad, the Western Air Express, and uh, Santa Fe Railroad. Uh -huh. And the passengers westbound from New York on the Transcontinental caught the Pansy out of New York to Columbus, Ohio. Uh -huh. and there they had a, a landing a platform there alongside the railroad and an airport, which, by the way, is still Columbus Airport. Uh -huh. uh, and the passengers would get off the train at this landing shed and be boarded onto a trimotored Ford and be flown then uh, to where do you think their first night stop was? Where, sir? Winoka, Oklahoma. Winoka? And I doubt that you even know where it is. <laughs> and uh, Winoka was uh, one of the major terminals, uh, and they would offload the airplane at Winoka, put them on the Santa Fe, and take them to Clovis, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Then they'd board uh, another airplane and take them on into Los Angeles, or Glendale, where they were landing at the time. But uh, I've often thought about that hangar at Winoka. The town is not very big. I haven't been back there in, in 35 years, I haven't seen it. But it was one of the most renowned uh, names on the airline maps of the world as the first transcontinental air transport, and it stayed in existence up until I understood since returning home that they sold a hangar, the old original hangar, for a hay shed. And just since I've been back, it has uh, dismounted and sold to some farmer up there for a hay shed. Isn't it too bad that something like that can't be but preserved? But it, it is a uh, shame to think that that little insignificant town uh -huh. <laughs> was so prominent in the late 20s uh -huh. as the the terminal. Columbus, Ohio, and Oklahoma, Clovis, New Mexico, and Los Angeles, California, we are four points. The first transcontinental. On the transcontinental. Uh -huh. So uh, it seems the same. We didn't have a plaque or memorialize it some way. Well, perhaps somebody will now. But uh, general aviation uh, went along the same way, and we've, uh, we've had airplane factories made here. In Tulsa, at the beginning before the World War II, the Douglas plant was built in Tulsa, mm -hmm. which uh, was one of the largest airplane plants in the country. Many of you remember it was the first blackout uh, plant built. It was built on the uh, east side of the Tulsa Municipal Airport. It's now a part of the whole airport. and. Uh, I think it was over a mile long, the plant, 5,300 and some feet, anyway. And uh, then the big fight came on in Fort Worth and Dallas, and Eamon Carter copied this and got him to build a plant in, in uh, Fort Worth, which is now the General Dynamics plant, which was in the consolidated uh, aircraft plant manufacturing mil uh, military airplanes. Uh, today, the Douglas plant in Tulsa is only operated by North American, which are the builders of the X-70, mm -hmm. the supersonic uh, military transport, and the biggest of the supersonics and is flying and has had a half a dozen flights up to now. 
Then after the World War, they also put in a modification plant in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. And uh, after World War II, we of American Airlines wanted to move our maintenance and engineering and overall out of LaGuardia Field because of, we did not have uh, adequate uh, place. And we chose to bring it to the Southwest. And I negotiated a deal to uh, with the government to take over the Douglas Modification Plant. The Northeast had the Tulsa Municipal Airport. Later got it conveyed to the city of Tulsa and now is owned by the city of Tulsa and American has a long-term lease. We put $21 million in that plant in Tulsa. And we have never had less than 4,000 employees. In fact, we're in about 4,500 now. So you see, that is big business. And with the North American and Douglas and, and uh, uh, American, that aviation is, plays a significant part in the economy of Tulsa. Uh, many people have asked me why I didn't bring it to my city of Oklahoma City. Well, I assure you that uh, nothing that I would have enjoyed more personally, but Oklahoma City didn't have any facility like that. Uh -huh. During the war, they'd built it for Douglas in Tulsa. It was now surplus. There was a chance to get it and uh, get at it and move in and, and stay up with the progress and growth of American, where in Oklahoma City it would have been impossible to get anything done for several years because you'd have to start brand new, build a plant, build an airport to house it and all that. So that is the reason that American Airlines is in Tulsa and not in Oklahoma City. And we've enjoyed our relationship in Tulsa very much. I'm sure we'd have had the same friendship and hospitality cooperation here, but this was a wartime facility, declared surplus for which we needed and we get tough. In the field of general aviation, uh, there's hardly a place in Oklahoma that has the birthplace of some one that has become very great in the years uh, since World War I. Uh, many of your great aces of World War II uh, were uh, Oklahomans. I can think of Bill Ponder from Mangum was one of it was Oklahoma's first World War One ace. Came from the town of Mangum. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pete Mitcher, Admiral Mitcher, yeah. Mark Mitcher right. was from here from Oklahoma City. His family were merchants here, his father. His brother was in school with me to Central High School called Oklahoma City High School. And uh, Mark went to the academy from here and became one of your great uh, leaders, uh, Admiral Mitchell of the Navy. He was the one that took Jim Doodle out for his uh, attack on Tokyo for the Doolittle Raiders. A great, a great uh, military man and highly regarded throughout the world. Ira Eaker, uh, General Eaker, one of the great ones. Jimmy Hazlip, Virgil Hines, Fritz Borum, names that are very prominent in the field of aviation. Jack Fry, the creator of Transcontinental Western Air, uh, was born and raised in Cimarron, Oklahoma, out in the Panhandle. Uh -huh. And uh, always held Oklahoma as his native state. Bob Cantwell from Stillwater, whose father was the president of the Oklahoma and AM for so long. He was a great father. Great pilot, and uh, was one that uh, interested Earl Halliburton, and he was uh, with Earl Halliburton for many, many years. A great, great pilot. Morris Mars from Oklahoma City uh, started being around airplanes just by wiping the grease off of the wings, mm -hmm. and became a pilot. Went on with United and was a senior captain of United Airlines and for many years flew the devil's stretch between Chicago and, uh, and New York in the early days. It's all been written about as hell's stretch and so forth. He was uh, very prominent. Went from United when KLM, the great airline, uh, Dutch airline, uh, bought the Douglas DC-3s. He went over there and took with him the American pilots and flew for five years over there training the Dutch to operate their own airline. <coughs> He's now here in Oklahoma City, retired. He was a great, great pilot. 
And then, of course, the dean of all the old ones was Burl Tibbs. Burl Tibbs, who was an early bird in the flying game from Louisiana, and but has been here ever since World War I. And although he has not been a tremendous success financially, he has been a tremendous success in uh, being the dean of the Flyers of Oklahoma. And although he's not well now, I hope that he continues in better health so that we can all have the privilege of paying our respects to a great early day uh, aviator of Oklahoma. I mentioned uh, B.S. Graham, Chibi Graham. Mm -hmm. Chibi is from uh, Alice, Texas. Was in World War One, came here immediately afterwards, and went in the airplane business. He had the Graham Flying Service. He now is the executive director of the Independent Milk Cooperative, Gilded Edge Milk, or whatever it is. This big, uh -huh. and a tremendous. You see him on television and radio all the time, uh -huh. speaking on behalf of the uh, regular programs yeah. for the Independent Milk Producers Association. A tre tremendous fellow, Clarence Page. I mentioned uh, B.S. Graham, Chibi Graham. Uh -huh. Chibi is from uh, Alice, Texas. Was in World War I, came here immediately afterwards and went in the airplane business. He had the Graham Flying Service. He now is the executive director of the Independent Milk Cooperative, Gilded Edge Milk or whatever it is. This uh -huh. And a tremendous, you see him on television and radio all the time, uh -huh. speaking on behalf of the uh, regular programs. Yeah. for the Independent Milk Producers Association, a tre tremendous fellow. Clarence Page, the son of an uh, early day policeman here in Oklahoma City, from out here close to Tinkert, Crooked Oak, went to school here, went into service late in uh, World War I, but uh, came back here and has been active in practically every aviation project in Oklahoma City since. He now is the president of the Page Aircraft Maintenance Corporation and their service contractors to uh, the military and uh, half a dozen fields from Honolulu to Georgia. <coughs> a great enthusiast and a, a great person and a great citizen. Uh, I could go on and point out men that are you don't remember in that because they only took a short stay in aviation and left. I stayed in it and uh, was identified with Earl Halliburton. I was identified with the early days of Branagh. Uh, I was identified with the early days of the transcontinental and western air and the early day of NAT, the National Air Transport. But, and so before uh, uh, going into the airplane manufacturing and engineering business, I was very active in uh, the early days of those which are now very prominent airlines. Uh, I couldn't uh, start to name you all of the people that have uh, been so interested. I'm talking about business interest. Mm -hmm. But I can say generally there have been very few that have been opposed to the acceptance of the airplane. You would think that when the city was founded more on the basis of railroads that they'd have a lot of them that would still be reluctant to encourage a new form of transportation. But that is not true. Oklahoma City was one of the earliest to recognize the importance of truck transportation over the road transportation. And I recall very well in the earlier days when uh, the railroad would go out and try to get their uh, customers mm -hmm. to legally and legislatively and every other way to, <laughs> to uh, prohibit over the truck, tr over the road hauling, and many of them felt the same way about the development of an airport, which would bring on another form of transportation. We in aviation uh, <laughs> were so vulnerable, I presume, they couldn't arouse much enthusiasm because no one could conceive that the airplane would ever be a means of transporting people and products uh -huh. of any great extent. Even the most enthusiastic supporters never had much hope that it would ever be uh, developed as a really a competitive form of transportation to the railroads. So we had their full and complete enthusiasm. All of it brought to Oklahoma a terrific name in the field of aviation. And we are only at the threshold, as I said, the whole industry is the same age as our state, and I know our state has a tremendous future, 
mm-hmm. in industry and the cultures and the arts and all that. And I know that aviation will have a tremendous future and contribute much to the growth of uh, Oklahoma and uh, to the future growth of commerce. Do you have any questions, Frank? Well, I probably have a million questions, and I'll try and uh, get back to some of those important items, because if we can, although I, I'm, I'm certain that uh, <coughs> it's really not easy to set and pick dates out of the air, but uh, you recall when, uh, well, say, our homegrown general aviation uh, quality product, Aero Commander, came into existence, don't you? Yes, uh, they came in here with a design that the pews of Pittsburgh had bought from Douglas. That airplane, the Commander, was, was uh, designed by Northrop and by Douglas as a design airplane, but never put on the boards. Mm-hmm. He bought this deal and brought it in here along in about 13 I'd say 39 mm-hmm. when his first contact made here. Mm-hmm. And of course, keep in mind, the Air Commander has never built a military airplane. Right. So they have uh, developed more on the basis of uh, uh, the commercial airplane. If they could have gotten some military contracts, it would have been a tremendous plant out there today, but they haven't had them. And uh, Although they have sold the individual airplane to the individual commands, they've never had a mass production of military craft. Mm-hmm. Pews uh, lived here, as you yeah. know, and built it, and then the Amos brothers came in here, Rufus and Bill Amos. They bought a part interest in it, and uh, they operated it for uh, quite a while in the early days of building mm-hmm. the Air Commander. And that was the reason that Wiley Post Airport is there. In order for them to put that plant there, they had to give them a plant with an airstrip. Uh So they chose this area south and west of uh, Hefner Uh called Two Lakes. So Uh the city, Chamber of Commerce again in the city, Uh bought the property and made available to them an airport on which to build their plant, which now is the air commander at Wiley Post Airport. Uh They've really made some strides. Yes, they? they have. It's a marvelous airplane, and I hope a complete success in their new models, which are the turboprops and the jet powered. Uh-huh. What about uh, uh, the perennial? I suppose we could spend a lot of time on on him, Wiley Post. Wiley Post was uh, one of the greatest of the early day aviators. He had no technical uh, background for the airplane, I mean for uh, going into aviation. He had no science training, he had no engineering, but he was a natural scientist and a natural flyer. He did not choose aviation at first. He was an oil field worker, Uh tool dresser, and he worked in the oil field south of Chickasaw in the cash fields, as uh, I recall. and. Although he had uh, shown an idea for the thrill of flying, it was not until he lost his eye in an oil field accident that he uh, uh, had an opportunity to take up aviation uh, as a pilot. He took his compensation award for the loss of his eye and worked with compensation and uh, bought some time, and that started him off as a pilot. And with, as I said, little or no training, and only one eye, keep that in mind. Uh With one eye, you wonder how you get depth perception, which is one of the most important things to the the proper ability of piloting, is your depth perception. How he trained himself to to get a relative depth perception, uh, I don't understand yet, although he's told me many times how he did it. Uh It uh, is a terrific achievement. There's a lot of discipline and a lot of training in it. Another thing about Wiley, he was a timid person, a shy person, and uh, uh, he knew uh, that his background was not enough to parade with, but he wouldn't apologize for it, of course, but at the same time he felt it within him, a kind of an inferiority complex amongst people. Mm -hmm. But he had tremendous discipline and he presented himself well. 
Wally is the contributor of not just his round-the-world flight and his great flying he did, races and all of that, but the things that will live forever in the history of Wally Post is the uh, development of the pressure suit. With every air astronaut flies today, Wally Post conceived that, designed it, and had Goodrich build it. Mm -hmm. uh, gets their best wishes. They saw no future for such a gadgetry. He's the same on supercharging. Mm -hmm. in the cabin and uh, the cockpit that he started, supercharged his flying suit, and, um, uh, and that will live forever as one of the great scientific uh, achievements, and yet uh, a boy with no scientific training at all. Created it, invented it, thought of it. And many of the fine things in navigation were promoted by, uh, by Wiley. And, uh, it was, uh, he not only was a great pilot and a great person, but uh, his name will long live in the history of aviation. I'm glad he was no king. Didn't you, weren't you involved in planning a round the world trip for the uh, yes, conjunction uh, of the World's Fair? Uh, yes, for the Century of Progress. Century of Progress. And uh, Rufus Dawes, as you remember, was Secretary mm -hmm. of the Interior, and his uh, Charlie Dawes, I mean, and his brother Rufus was the chairman of the Century of Progress in Chicago. And uh, Wiley and Clarence Page and Benny Griffin, the names I mentioned before, mm -hmm. we were all what you'd call unemployed aviators <laughs> in the Depression uh, uh -huh. days. And I came down here and uh, I'd been testing tri-motored Bach airplanes, B-A-C-H. They were made in Van Nuys, California. Smaller airplane than the Falker and the Ford, but some 20 miles faster and a tre tremendous amount of performance because they were small enough to do something with. So they wanted me to uh, tell them about the Bach airplane, but the Bach airplane suffered with the depression, so they had six or seven of them on the line. There was no market for them. So I put this thing together and we worked out a program of going around the world nonstop. So uh, if uh, you can, you wouldn't remember here, but obviously we had to know how to refuel. Uh -huh. And this then came along at a time when endurance records were being set all over the country. Right. St. Louis uh -huh. had them, the, uh, I remember Red Jackson, uh -huh. and uh, uh, the Hunter Boys, one of them now is the chief pilot for Kerr McGee here. From Cairo, Illinois. They broke a record in off Lambert Field there. I guess Lambert Field had a half a dozen uh -huh. endurance records uh, going and coming there all the time. And uh, so when we got into this thing, well, then Benny Griffin uh, set up there and they set up a 100 hour endurance record over what is now Will Rogers Airport to, to refuel it. To get the techniques of refueling, Benny became authority on refueling. Now, Wiley became the authority on navigation. I became the authority on communications and the tankers. Uh -huh. So we worked out a program uh, to go around the world from Chicago to Chicago uh, nonstop by refueling with the Bach airplanes into the Winnie Mae, the Lockheed Vega that Wiley was to fly. He and Benny were to fly it. Benny was to handle the co-piloting and, and handle the, the nozzle uh -huh. for the refueling. So we had it all worked out. And we had a uh, fellow here in the town. Uh, God bless him, he was an enthusiast. He's now gone. He had a Buell biplane. Who is that? Huh? Who, what, what was his name? Jim, uh... Yeah. I hesitate to break your train of thought, but I'd like to get oh, that well, name off. Oh, well, I will. Nail! What was the old man's name that I'm always talking about that lived in? 15th and Lincoln, his wife is still alive, and I want to go by and see her. But then, uh, looking at that yellow stud, uh, the paper you had the other day, 
Jim Brazil. Oh, now we don't have to think about it now. <laughs> James Brazil. Uh -huh. Yeah, please. All right. Uh, Jim Brazil had a Buell biplane. I don't know if you ever saw a biplane cabin airplane. But <laughs> I, don't, I may have seen a picture similar to it. But as I have so he uh, volunteered to uh, let me have the airplane. So I took it and flew to Chicago and met with the board of Century of Progress. And it was accepted with overwhelming uh, enthusiasm. They'd never seen anything like it. You've seen uh -huh. the original document I worked for. I stayed up there about two months. And as I said, we were, uh, the boys were active to get doing something. But the depression was such that they were awfully afraid and they had to cancel out so many projects. Mm -hmm. But this would be the kickoff and the sensation of the opening of the century of progress, and they need not tell you how the media would handle a thing like that as it oh. moved from one refueling on, which was unknown of in those days for That's that right. uh, endurance flight refueling in, in the air for a flight. And the more the Trib and all of them got interested in that with their chief people, the more that they could see that when he came out over Alaska, you know, and heading for the home stretch, and God, what a sensation it'd be in the world of radio, which was right. its field then. And that how the people would be out on their doorsteps in the middle of the streets looking to get a glimpse of this airplane that just circled the world nonstop. And you know, they thought, and they saw how they could use it throughout the whole year of the century of progress, plus the following year, there's a two year plan, you know. Surely. Uh -huh. And, but they, uh, the depression was such they didn't want to come commit. We had to have the money then to acquire the airplane, which I had uh, available, and uh, to start building our maps. Mm -hmm. And they were terribly disappointed, but we had to call it off. Well, the, the first year wasn't a very good century of progress, but the second year became a complete success. Right. So they've often said to me, and we've said to ourselves, if we'd have just had someone to, had the confidence to back us, we did uh, do you recall what that budget was? Eighty-seven thousand dollars, wasn't it, for total? Something like that, yeah. I have it right there. Right. I can get it. For I you. think it was approximately that, which in itself. But that that's was including the, price of the aircraft. That was including the price of the aircraft, the fuel, uh -huh. the radio communications uh -huh. we'd have to have in order to make contact. Uh -huh. Now people know they said it couldn't be done. Today, you have uh, air-to-ground contact and air-to-air -air contact for everything you do. Uh -huh. All maneuvers today are executed by the uh, by the electronics that we had uh, proposed at the time. It wasn't, we weren't out in left field. We knew what we were talking about. Didn't Wiley Post used to fly off a field up on North May? There, uh, well, that is, uh, yes. In fact, we named the Wiley where Johnny Burke's subdivision is now. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Right off of now, there, right uh, by the, where the big tower is. The water tower. The water tower, but it never had any water in it. <laughs> <laughs> and we kid Johnny about his control tower. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, that was uh, Wiley <coughs> flew off of there, and it then was named Wiley Post Airport. <clears throat> what was it, just a strip? No, it was a pasture out there. It didn't have any uh, surfacing. Mm -hmm. It was all in that Bermuda grass, you see. The hangar's still there. The hangar's a part of the shopping center. If you'll see that little shopping center, look at the back there. <laughs> I <laughs> recall they put the facade around. Oh, right, that's right. right. And the hangar's still and there. And they call it the hangar, I believe. And it was there that I think they do. And it was there that uh, Tom Braniff's only son was killed on that field. Mm. And uh, Thurman Braniff. But Johnny Burke bought that Curtis Flying Service, uh, put it in. Mm -hmm. The Curtis Wright Flying Service, which was in the early day, they had fields and schools all over the United States and sales agencies for the right. Curtis product. And then when they went broke in the Depression, they tried to sell it. Do you think anybody would buy it? No. And I won't attempt to say what Johnny Burke paid for that, and I think there was 100 acres. But uh, no one would buy it, and Johnny Burke was a mechanic, and a good one. Uh -huh. And uh, he raised around and got a commitment no one else would have it, including Doc Nichols, the developer of Nichols Hill. Wanted no, no part of it because it wouldn't grow. Uh, it wasn't, that wasn't his plan. <laughs> you know, today it's probably one of the most valuable pieces of property 
in uh, Oklahoma City. That, that is in the city, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. It's a city. The village is not. But no. But Johnny Burke, that's the Burke housing deal. I mean, he uh, builds houses. And some uh -huh. Development is he sees fit development. Uh -huh. But that was Wiley's original flying plan. Any, when, other, any other questions, when Frank? When was this uh, area, this downtown air park, uh, is that a recent? Uh, yes, that is uh, recent. That couldn't have been there, you see, until they straightened the river and controlled the Canadian. Right. That used to be flood water to the area. All that whole south, that valley in there would always flood with your know, spring and fall rains. Mm -hmm. When they straightened the river, uh, John Boardman, the Boardman Company, saw that when they wouldn't have any more floods, they could start, start industrially developing that south end. So they put in that little old strip because we would be close into town. Mm -hmm. They didn't expect it to live very long. But with the airplanes were designed to fit it, and so it became a quite an important adjunct, although it's not a city operation. It's a private operation. Isn't that city property? No. no it isn't? No, it's all private property. But they're pretty busy down there. Though. Yes, they are, and it's, it, it has been a tremendous uh, thing. It could have been developed more, but it's taken care of an awful lot of airplanes in general aviation. Oh, well, it's rather hemmed in at the present. Yes, well, of course. As got. far as the uh, expansion That's of the airport, right. and bigger airport. You never get an east-west runway in there, you know. Mm -hmm. That's private enterprise. We had several private airports. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, the county you have one now on Northeast 63rd and I-35. There's one out there. That, uh, so, that strip there, yeah. the dare, isn't it? Yeah, I, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, they seem to be busy out there and a lot of aircraft around there. The city plan will have to put in a city airport someplace in the east, and it, uh, whether that site or not, because uh, for general aviation I'm talking about. Uh, there's a need for it, and these people are serving a very important need, both at down, downtown and at uh, Northeast uh -huh. 63rd. I uh, noticed that uh, to update this right to the present time, today being Tuesday, the 23rd of February, a council meeting, and I saw a note in the Oklahoman that uh, uh, there'd be consideration of the Braniff contract for space in the new terminal. Well, uh, will be taken up today. I hope it does, and I'm glad to hear it because uh, the new terminal, I understand all of the air carriers have agreed mm -hmm. upon the rates and the locations and all. Now they're executing the contracts. Mm -hmm. So I'm delighted that uh, it's come up this soon. Uh, American, TWA, and Continental, and Central, will all, uh, they're all in general offices going through the legal department. But uh, they'll have no problem with the carriers. Mm -hmm. But it involves more than carriers in that project because they have concessionaires and all of that's up before the council too. Well, it would seem that the uh, the end result of the study that has been made for the airport or the terminal facility uh, well, according to well the last talk I had with Bill Coleman, good old Bill, yeah. that uh, they've eliminated a lot of the uh, uh, sort of ungainly type of construction elsewhere around the country. Yes, uh, uh, I'm, I want to commend everybody that has anything to do with it. Yeah. It appears to be a very modern and a, a very usable uh, terminal. And that includes everything, the parking facilities of the automobile, uh, clear on to the parking facilities and loading and unloading the aircraft itself. Well, human beings, of course, like we're all lazy. We don't like to walk too far, park our car, get out of a cab or a limousine to that's an right. aircraft. We don't want to walk too far. Uh, no, and that's one of the faults, but that's a penalty of growth. That's right. Because uh, if you can't build anything better today than it was built yesterday, something's wrong with the science. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, Oklahoma City should have the most modern, and I think it will have. Well, with the addition of the parallel strip, north-south runway. I only hope that we can saturate the, the parallel runways. Well, we've, uh, our uh, loading has been going up by 
each it, year it, by a true. fair percentage. It is true. And it's important in Oklahoma City to have good air transportation just like it is to have water transportation for mm -hmm. service rates. And there's also, you're probably very well aware, of the fact that the, uh, the move to try and get some air carrier service up to the northwest out of here. Yes, in fact, it's before the Civil Air and Arts Board now, and the hearing started last week. Mm -hmm. So they will come. Now it's up to Oklahoma City to see if they get on that route. There's a lot of them want to go by St. Louis, a lot of them want to go by Tulsa. Uh -huh. I'm talking about the communities. Right. So Oklahoma City has to fight to see that the route is established through here, not around us. Uh, the old uh, airline uh, uh, bromide, which is so true, use it or lose it. That is, uh, well, they are using it. Uh, and, uh, of course, the big complaint is that the carriers don't have enough service going where they want to go. But the finest businessmen in town don't realize that if you go every day, you've got to have a payload. Uh -huh. And I think that uh, was an example shown here recently by some of the businessmen when they backed this run from here to Fort Smith uh -huh. with air commanders. All right. Tom Harris told them they didn't have enough business to pay for fuel. Yes, they did, because some fellow, not mention names, uh, traveled his men to Fort Smith regularly. Well, we kind of find out that they made seven trips a month. Well, you can't run five trips a day with, say, folks <laughs> here at Fort Smith mm. for an uh, industry that only has seven trips a month into Fort Smith. I recall that. Uh, and that only it, lasted a few days. It was an unfortunate venture. I went over on the first trip with them. Uh, well, it, it never had a chance to survive. And, it was, uh, and Tom Harris, at that time general manager of Air Commander, sat right in this office and told them. I went over their figures and told them they couldn't exist a week. Couldn't pay, pay for their fuel. But no, they knew better. And Tom was sitting in here and said, well, Red's been in this business all his life, and one thing he knows, he does know the economics of operation. But enthusiasm sometimes <laughs> leads you a long way. <laughs> but it wasn't well founded. It no. wasn't the fall of the airplane. No, nor the fall of the people. Just Not a right. misplaced right. judgment, that's, that's all. Right. Well, uh, airplanes, people who are enthusiastic about aircraft and uh, they played a great part in the history of our city. There's no no argument about, about it. It has kept them from being and wound around, and I can remember the start of Oklahoma City when uh, I was a kid. And uh, I remember when we bought the first packing plant here. Mm -hmm. Then it was so set up on the basis, well, now let's not bring any more packing plants. Because mm -hmm. uh, we've We've uh, moved here to become a part of you, and that's protecting the city. You only have one of everything. <laughs> well, very thankful for men like Ed Overholzer and Stanley Draper and others that they said, no, that isn't the way we're going to build a city. We're going to build a city on the basis of getting all we can get of all we can get. But there was a strong influence in the early days of how many lumber yards uh, you would encourage in here. Uh -huh. And it's true in the early days of the trucks. Mm -hmm. When they started the uh, buses and trucks. A um, man would have a route from here to Ardmore. He didn't want any other uh, competition, whether it's over the road or through or anything else, go over 77 to Ardmore. They wanted that and wanted the cities to help fight anybody else coming in. Well, I'm thankful for the fact that Oklahoma City didn't buy that concept of city improvement development. You know, it's strange. Uh, there may be some very economic reasons, too, uh, since uh, Branham started here, why they left. It was financing. <coughs> it was a local service carrier. It was it never would have been in existence if it hadn't been for the fine Oklahoma delegation in Congress uh -huh. getting them the permit. But Keith Kale uh, was the promoter of it here, and uh, he didn't have uh, very adequate financing when uh, Kirk Johnson in Fort Worth, a very wealthy man, said, well, uh, I'll buy the control of it and finance it on through, and he did with the understanding he'd move the headquarters to Fort Worth. Uh -huh. And Kirk Johnson put the money in, had control of the company, financed it, and then he insisted on it moving to Fort Worth. That's how simple it was. That's on Central? Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, Braniff, uh, the time because he started here, the Braniff building, the Braniff right. Insurance Company, and the money was all uh, raised here. And uh, Braniff kept the general offices here. When I went with Braniff, the general offices were here. Mm -hmm. The operating headquarters were in Dallas. Braniff, when they bid the first air route, got the uh, route from Dallas North to Chicago. That was their route. The Long Harmon Company bid the Texas route, which was Amarillo to Dallas and on down to Brownsville and Houston, Galveston. That, uh, all that leg was Long Harmon airmail. Then when Braniff bought Long Harmon and combined it with his AM-9, that gave him a system from Chicago to Brownsville and Chicago to, to Galveston from Amarillo. To Galveston or down. So the operation had to be in the center. It couldn't have been here because we didn't go any place. We only went north south out of Oklahoma City in right. those days. And so the operations had to be there so we could maintain overhaul and dispatch the airplanes going in all directions. Uh -huh. So the operations uh, was in Dallas and the general office is here. Uh -huh. Well, when the uh, Winter, uh, Christmas, of uh, two days before Christmas, 36, I'd already announced to be going to Branoff as a general manager. And uh, we had a test airplane the day, the noon of the afternoon family party for the employees of Branoff in uh -huh. Dallas, Lowfield. And so the vice president of operations decided to fly the test airplane. It was an engine change was all. He invited all his department heads to go up with him, and then they would land in front of the terminal where their family and children were for their Christmas party. Right. He went up there and he made his approach to land and overshot and reached over to catch hold of his throttles to pull out and abort and go around. And uh, his starboard engine wouldn't take. And he was not too adept at And so the vice president of operations decided to fly the test airplane. It was an engine change was all. Uh -huh. He invited all his department heads to go up with him, and then they would land in front of the terminal where their family and children were for their Christmas party. Right. He went up there and he made his approach to land and overshot and reached over to catch hold of his throttles to pull out and abort and go around. And uh, his starboard engine wouldn't take. And he was not too adept at handling. He was not a line pilot. He was a very fine executive, but wasn't too much of a pilot. And the airplane got loose from him. They let them on the shores of Bachman Lake and Love Field, and all were destroyed. Mm. So that's how come me then have to leave in a hurry and get down to uh, Dallas to try to rebuild a company. And then after it was, it's obvious that it had no business having a general office here because right. all the activity was there. Down there, right. So then Tom decided to move the general offices down, consolidate it, because operation was his biggest business. Right. So Tom and Bess moved down there, and that's how come Dallas to have been a fair way. I know you mentioned uh, Tinker and uh, what a fantastic effect it has had, uh, not only on the economic picture of oh. Oklahoma City, but uh, I think in every other way, don't you? Yes, I do. We've had some splendid men here, Commander Tinker. Yes, we have, and and in this last shakedown, as you notice, they closed three other material commands and consolidated from Rome, New York, on uh, through Georgia and Alabama and brought them here. Well, it looks to be as permanent as any military As any can be. Uh, as can be, because they never get into a permanent oh, state. Oh, no, no, you can't expect that. But it is a tremendous thing, and the people that are responsible for it are the businessmen under the guidance of the abilities of Stanley Draper. Uh -huh. The Oklahoma Industrial Group went out there, bought it, sold it, continued to buy land, continued to make it available to the government, and uh, 
business and social climate of Oklahoma City has gone all out to favor mm -hmm. the, uh, the industry of Tinker Field, and they appreciate it. There doesn't seem to be any question about it. We find that reaction that's right. that's so evident. Well, Red, thank you so much. I think. Well, I could go on and on in my life's avocation, which yeah. is aviation, but I've only hit the highlights of things I think important for the record. Right. The other uh, is all uh, history and experiences and all of that, which is interesting, but not for recording, uh, because ultimately someone will write them, and somebody will differ with uh, their experiences. <laughs> but this is historically and chronologically uh, a very brief uh, explanation of what has happened in our few short years and uh, what the industry has done uh, for the good of the state of Oklahoma and for the city of Oklahoma City. And actually we're just starting out. Oh, we, just like our state. The state is not old. The state is young. The industry is youngest of transportation.